Good afternoon. This is Joyce Pratt, and I am here with Susan Lawrence. We are going to present Preparing for the Climb, Top 5 Employment Policies to Revamp This Year. We'd like to welcome you all to this TCLE, which is presented by Thompson Colburn, Knowledge Where You Are, and presented by Susan Lawrence, who is a partner in our Human Resources uh, Department for Labor and Employment Attorneys in our Chicago office, and Joyce Pratt, who's an associate in the Human Resources uh, Department as well for Labor and Employment Attorneys. Okay, so for top five employment policies to revamp in 2015, we're going to cover four th different areas. Um, one has two different policies that we'll talk about. So the electronic communications policy, then we'll do workplace drug policy, the OFCCP self-identification requirements, and then anti-discrimination harassment policies. First up is our electronic communications policy, and there's been a significant development in the law that we'd like to talk about. So true or false, employers may prohibit employees from using email during non-work hours to communicate with other employees about union activity. This is false. Thanks to the National Labor Relations Board, decision in Purple Communications, which came out in December 11, 2014. In that decision, the board determined that employee use of email for statutorily protected communications on non-working time must be permitted if, and that's the big if, employers have has given the employees access to its email system. Now this has changed and overruled the board's decision in 2007 in Register Guard. And the main reason that the board felt that this needed to change was that the email is now the new water cooler. It's the gathering place where people get together and chat and talk about the terms and conditions of their employment. And that's why they determined that Register Guard no longer was applicable in the workplace environment. Now, I'm sure you all know that statutorily protected communications include concerted activity, union activity, joining together to advance the interest as employees, discussing terms and conditions of employment, initiating, inducing, or preparing for group action, and bringing group complaints to management's attention. So all of these activities, which are protected activities under the National Labor Relations Act, are now things that people can communicate through their email system as long as they have been granted access to email. But the board's decision is limited. It applies only to employees who have already been granted access to the employer's email system in the course of their work, and it does not require employers to provide email access to their employees. Employers may justify a, ba a total ban on non-work use of emails, including Section 7 use, which is our, those protected activities, during non-working time if special circumstances make the ban necessary to maintain production or discipline. Now this is a rare situation for a total ban. And absent justification for a total ban, employers may apply uniform and consistently enforced controls over its email system. What the board decision does not address is that email access by non-employees any other type of electronic communication systems within the, the work environment, such as community chat rooms, intranets, uh, electronic bulletin boards, and those things, which typically we have restricted employees from using to engage in concerted protected activity. So when you're looking at your electronic communications policy, the things that we recommend that you include in your policy is that the purpose of the com company's electronic communications is to conduct company's business, making sure that there's security measures in place and that access is limited through those security measures and through passwords. Having a policy to include the parameters for personal use and basic etiquette. Additional things to include in the policy is that there is no expectation of privacy. The communications must comply with company policies such as harassment and confidentiality. And this is consistent with um, most of the recommendations that we make with social media policies as well. That those communications that are made cannot be violating discrimination policies or anti-harassment policies and other confidential uh, policies that the company may have about communications. So internet and social media use, personal 
similar to those policies, we want to make sure that personal opinions expressed are not those of the company and that that information is provided when someone is sharing their own opinions. Having virus scanning software and not being able to download or install uh, non-company applications. Licensing issues and violation will lead to appropriate disciplinary action. I'm going to hand it over to Susan now to discuss the workplace drug policy. Thank you very much, Joyce, and greetings, everyone, from beautiful Chicago. Um, it's 75 degrees and sunny, so if any of you plan on calling your Chicago attorney this afternoon, don't be surprised if they don't answer their phone. Um, we are going to talk about the changes in the landscape for um, drugs, specifically marijuana. Um, as I'm sure you all have heard, there's been quite a lot of development over the last couple of years on states passing their own legislation to approve either recreational drug use or um, uh, medical marijuana drug use. And as you see on this slide, we're up to 23 states in the District of Columbia that allow for medical marijuana usage, and there are four states um, that also allow for recreational marijuana use. Um, and there's similar legislation pending in several other states, including as well as the District of Columbia. This next slide shows um, a map of the various states where this has occurred. Uh, you can take a look and see if your state is included. For those of you in Missouri, you'll see that there's no legislation one way or the other about um, uh, legalizing marijuana. We here in Illinois have medical marijuana that was recently um, approved by the state legislature. We're going through quite a few changes or issues right now with our new governor, uh, but the state of the law right now is that if you're in Illinois, um, there is the opportunity to have medically prescribed marijuana. And so we're dealing with that a lot and have a lot of calls coming in from clients of what does this mean for us? How does this all play out? And in many regards, we're still figuring that out. The, the um, case law has not caught up with the statute. And in many states, Illinois included, there are things that the statute answers and there are things that the statute does not. So we're here to help you navigate through all this weedy, pardon the pun, uh, uh, situation and, and hope that by drafting and revising policies, we should be able to protect you, the employer, from these trappings. So what are some of the issues we see? Um, Question number one, can employers discipline, including up to termination, uh, employees who test positive for marijuana? And the answer is generally yes. God forbid an attorney just say a black and white yes to anything. Most state statutes carve out exemptions for employers that prohibit any use of marijuana in the workplace or on the employer's premises, as well as any on-the-job intoxication. So this is um, anticipating a situation where the employee is consuming marijuana on the premises, whether it's medical or recreationally um, permitted, or if they're showing up to work high. It's tantamount to coming to work drunk, um, and we're entitled to allow our policies to prohibit that type of behavior. Question number two. This is where we start getting a little bit more difficult. Uh, can an employer discipline an employee for off hours and, and off site use or being under the influence when it's pursuant to a valid prescription or um, if it's permissible for recreational uses? And this is where it gets a little trickier. Uh, there is no clear answer. In some states, they expressly prohibit employers to some extent from firing an employee who um, has a positive marijuana drug test if that employee holds a valid medical marijuana card. Uh, we see this in Arizona, in Delaware, in Maine, and in Minnesota um, where there is uh, exceptions for individuals who would lose federal contract funding. So if, you're a, if you have a federal contract, and as we all know, it's still against the federal law to um, uh, partake in marijuana use, we are prevented or, or exempted from these rules. But some states do specifically prohibit an employer from firing an employee who tests positive for marijuana if they have a valid card. Uh, other states and uh, case law allows employers to lawfully implement a zero tolerance policy 
against drug use, regardless of the legality of the marijuana use under state law. Believe it or not, California is one of these states, as are Colorado, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. So you see right there in California, Colorado, um, Oregon, and Washington, the four states that also have permissible recreational drug use, that they are acknowledging that employers do have the right to implement a zero tolerance drug policy. These issues um, are still evolving in other states. For example, here in Illinois, um, we don't have as clear of a black and white on, on all the issues, but the Illinois statute does specifically state that employers may enforce a zero tolerance policy if it's applied non-discriminatorily, meaning if we don't allow for people to come to work um, high, even if legally entitled to do so from a medical perspective, we better make sure we're also taking a zero tolerance policy for things like other prescription drugs and alcohol. The Illinois statute does specifically say that we cannot discriminate against any employer applicant on the sole basis of their status as a registered qualified patient for medical marijuana. However, we are allowed to discipline employees who violate our um, zero tolerance policy. And we are allowed to discipline employees for failing a drug, a drug test if we are one of those employers that have a federal contract or um, if we are um, in the business of um, engaging in federal issues such as interstate commerce and things where we would be triggering a federal law if we allow our employees to um, uh, fail a drug test. Question number three, what about medical marijuana use as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA and state disability discrimination laws? And um, you've probably already picked up on the fact that with each passing question, it's getting trickier and trickier because ADA is an issue that all employers um, have to deal with and we are then trying to figure out the intersection between state law and federal law. Unfortunately, there is no clear answer on this one either. Uh, some state statutes specifically provide that an employer does not have to accommodate medical marijuana use in the workplace during work hours or allow employees to work under the influence. Uh, most states do not address off-site or off-duty use. It, they mainly just talk about what's going on in the workplace. But you can anticipate a situation where someone is um, uh, engaged in um, some sort of chemotherapy or other type of treatment. They need to have their medical marijuana to stave off any sort of um, pain that they're experiencing and they're working a 12-hour shift. What do we do? Do we allow them and accommodate them to use medical marijuana in the workplace, especially if the position itself is not one that requires the use of heavy machinery or in some other sort of safety um, uh, at risk position? And we need to address many of these on a case by case basis. We need to take a look and see how we've dealt with uh, prescription medication requests in other ADA situations in your workplace and make sure that we are treating those who have been um, permissibly prescribed medical marijuana the same way we've treated other individuals. Other states require employers to make reasonable accommodations, and Nevada and New York are examples of theirs, um, where we as the employer must make every attempt to uh, allow medical marijuana usage as a reasonable accommodation for the medical needs of the employee, provided, as I've already hinted at, that it does not pose a threat of harm or danger, cause an undue hardship, or prevent the employees from fulfilling their job responsibilities. And again, this is where we see issues involving uh, heavy machinery, operating forklifts. If you're in a manufacturing facility, I think it would be relatively easy to articulate that this would cause an undue hardship if you have a laborer um, who is requesting an accommodation to use his or her legally prescribed medical marijuana. Um, however, if somebody has more of a desk job, is not uh, tasked with exercising independent judgment, it might be less likely that a court would find that it would uh, be considered an undue burden for us to accommodate that. So really, Susan, what you're saying is it all goes back to that interactive process where you're engaging in with the employee to determine what the restrictions are and how those accommodations can would affect the workplace. That's, 
That's right. And if we move to the next slide, we'll sort of uh, go back to a primer of what it means to provide a reasonable accommodation. Um, and Joyce is exactly right. The analysis needs to be interactive. It should be prompted by the employee saying that they need a reasonable accommodation and this is what they would suggest. Uh, however, it's not enough for we, the employer, just to say, well, they didn't bring it up so we didn't raise the issue. Um, we need to always balance the reasonable accommodation discussion against whether it would create an undue burden on us. Money alone, as I'm sure you all know, is not uh, enough to um, establish the undue burden standard. But the other thing that's um, hiding out there in the background of an ADA analysis is whether or not this individual is, quote, a qualified individual. And a qualified individual is one that is able to perform the essential functions of the job with or without the reasonable accommodation. So if the use of medical marijuana would impair or interfere with the individual's ability to perform the essential functions of the job, it would not be considered a reasonable accommodation. Um, we've already talked about this a bit in a manufacturing um, facility, but here are some other examples. If the person is tasked with thinking, uh, problem solving, customer interaction, attention to task and safety, then it's quite possible that the use of marijuana would impair the person's ability to perform those essential job functions and a court would likely deem that not a reasonable accommodation. Again, this is where we are um, taking what we know about general ADA law and applying it to medical marijuana because in many instances, the cases and the um, uh, litigation has not caught up with the legislation. Um, again, it's not a reasonable accommodation if it poses a threat, causes a hun undue hardship, or prevents the employee from filling job duties. The key here on the poses a threat or danger is to think of it not only of whether it poses a danger to the individual requesting the accommodation, but also whether it poses a threat of harm or danger to other employees, customers, um, uh, property, um, and what have you. So it's a more expansive view. And we're always reconciling the harm that um, we will be exposing our employee to if we do not grant them the reasonable accommodation against the harm that we would be exposing our other employees to if we do. And those are the types of business decisions that um, you all have to make on a regular basis and uh, that should be done in consultation with an attorney. So then we get to uh, some of the more difficult, probably the most difficult question on all of this is, what about off-site, non-work hour, legally prescribed marijuana used by employees who qualified as disabled under the ADA when that off-site, non-work hour use results in a positive drug test? And without going into too great a detail about um, what different state laws say about positive drug tests and the levels of the um, uh, TCP that is is covered by this, and I'm happy to go into that kind of detail off offline. It just is very involved and would take up too much of our time. But um, let's just assume at this point in time we're just talking about a positive drug test. As most of you probably know. Um, unlike alcohol that does not stay in your system for a long time and therefore if you test an employee for um, alcohol use on the job, if they consumed it over the weekend, they likely will not still test positive on Monday. An individual who engages in marijuana use will likely have some remnants in their system for many days. So what do we do when we have no reason to believe they're coming to work um, high, but yet they still test positive for um, a drug test, be it a random drug test or what have you. What does the law say about that? Generally speaking, courts have said that it is not a reasonable accommodation and therefore we're allowed to enforce our zero tolerance policy. State and federal discrimination laws do not provide protection for disabled employees who appear for work intoxicated or quote, under the influence of illegal drugs. And remember, um, playing back here in the in the backdrop is the fact that marijuana is still illegal under federal law. So we're within our rights to um, continue to adhere to the concept of 
marijuana being an illegal drug, especially if we have our zero tolerance policy firmly um, solidified in our workplace policy in our handbook or what have you for uh, drug usage. So what are the tips to take away for workplace drug policies? We would strongly recommend that you go back and take a look at your handbook, especially if we are in one of those states that either has uh, legal recreational marijuana use or um, legal medical marijuana use. If you're in one of the four states with legal recreational marijuana use, make sure that your drug policy is tailored to address legal recreational marijuana use similar to um, your policy on alcohol use, which would say something to the effect of um, appearing for work intoxicated or under the influence of illegal drugs, including recreational marijuana. Now, there will be pushback from certain employees to say it's not illegal, and we will make clear that um, it is still illegal under federal law, and depending on what state you're in, you're still within your right to enforce a zero tolerance policy. If you're in a state with medical marijuana use, make sure that your drug policy is tailored to uh, address medical marijuana use similar to any other policy you have regarding legal drug use. For example, include verbiage that requires individuals to notify human resources if their prescription marijuana impairs their ability to perform job duties. We may also want to revise the zero tolerance drug policy to accommodate employees who treat their medical condition with marijuana during off work hours so that it's very clear that we have a right to enforce our zero tolerance policy even if they're not ingesting the medical marijuana on the job or during work hours. I will now turn it over to Joyce, who is going to talk about the OFCCP's self-identification changes. Now we are entering the most exciting part of this TCLE, so uh, please hold on to your hats because this is riveting information. So under Section 503, the regulations, uh, federal contractors invite applicants to self-identify RE regarding their disability. The regulations have been changed so that now we need to invite applicants to do that self-identification process pre-offer and post-offer. Prior to this, we held back and only did that post-offer. Pre-offer may be included in the contractor's application materials for a position, but must be kept separate from the application. So many employers have gone into having a separate form that allows people to, to self-identify whether they have a disability at the application stage, but that's removed from the application packet. It is just an opportunity for employers to capture that data in order to assist with uh, providing that information to the Department of Labor. So the OFCCP has developed a form for contractors to use to invite self-identification of a disability. This form cannot be modified. So if an employer uses the DOL form for the self-identification, they cannot modify this. This has to stay uh, completely as is when you get it off the, the DOL website. So we have a, a screenshot of that self-identification form, and that form is available at the DOL.gov website. Section 503 prohibits contractors from using qualification standards and selection criteria that screen out an individual with a disability or a class of individuals with disabilities. And these are, per, these are particular to employers who are federal contractors. And um, unless the contractor can show that the standards or criteria are job related for the position in question and consistent with business necessity, that's the only time that contractors can use those qualification standards to screen out applicants that might be disabled. Um, contractors cannot use selection criteria that relate to the performance of an essential function of the job to exclude individuals with disabilities if, that, if the person could satisfy the criteria with a reasonable accommodation. So once again, we're getting back into the ADA requirements for that interactive process that has to take place. So under the disability self-identification regulations, they have, contractors must invite their employees to self-identify every five years. And this is also a change because this requires ongoing collection of information. 
and at least once during the years in between, contractors must remind their employees that they may voluntarily update their disability status at any time. And what they're trying to do with this is capture those people who may have started out without being identified with a disability that have now had a disability or people who at some time had chosen not to self-identify but now that they're involved in the workplace and whatnot feel more comfortable to do that. Contractors may not compel or coerce individuals to self-identify and all of this self-identification information must be kept confidential. The other change that has come about is the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act, which is VEVRAA. These new regulations require that contractors invite applicants to self-identify as protected veterans at both the pre-offer and post-offer phases of the application process. Sample invitations to self-identify are available, but these are not forms that have to be followed without any modification which is what the disability self-identification forms are. So I know that that was extremely exciting and interesting, and so I'm gonna turn it back to Susan to get on to anti-discrimination and harassment policies. So uh, since I know we have uh, um, only the most sophisticated and intelligent listeners on the line, um, you probably picked up on the fact that our first slides slide said we were going to do the top five employment policies that needed to be changed, and then we had four items below it. Rest assured, you are not um, dealing with mathematically challenged individuals. My session actually encompasses two um, different areas where we're going to um, focus in on. And the next slide will show you three areas. So you're going to say, well, is this four or five or six different policies <laughs> we're talking about? Um, the sexual orientation and the gender identity and expression are really part and parcel, and we're going to talk about those together. So at the end of the day, there will be five different policies that we're going to talk about. Um, we have seen quite a bit of change in the last couple of years and um, uh, since last we presented in these various areas. And I think it really indicates a change in the viewing of the EEOC and where we'll probably see an uptick in cases that the EEOC is file, uh, filing in the upcoming years on the topics of pregnancy discrimination and sexual orientation, gender identity, gender identity and expression. In July of 2014, the EEOC issued updated enforcement guidance on pregnancy discrimination. As you may or may not be aware, there is the Pregnancy Disability Act of 1978. Um, this EEOC guidance covers that. It also touches upon equal access to benefits, and it specifically talks about the way in which the ADA interplays with all of this. So. Um, there is a broad reach to this EEOC guidance, and I think it's extremely important for all of us to go back and take a look at the policies in our handbook and the way in which we are addressing, or in many regards, not addressing the way in which we will um, uh, accommodate our female pregnant employees. Under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, Employers cannot fire, refuse to hire, demote, or take any other adverse action against a woman because of pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition. Um, that language tracks very closely to Title VII's language about protected characteristics that we're all very familiar with. Um, pregnancy Discrimination Act is directed solely to issues surrounding pregnancy, and it should note, um, be noted that pregnancy is not a protected characteristic under Title VII. Gender is, and often we see cases in which people bring a Title VII violation based on pregnancy, but there is the separate Pregnancy Discrimination Act that brings this all in. Uh, and the, pre the PDA's protection extends to different treatment based on an employee's fertility or childbearing capacity. So uh, banning women of a certain age from jobs with exposure to harmful chemicals is not permissible under the PDA nor um, should we um, just automatically make gender-specific job restrictions without ensuring that we have a bona fide occupational qualification for that. So if we want to limit a position to men only, we better be able to articulate a legitimate, good faith, bona fide reason for that. And rest assured, that is not an easy standard to make. 
the PDA also extends to medical conditions related to pregnancy. So uh, if an employee is suffering from back pain, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, or complications requiring bed rest and lactation, these would be deemed um, disabilities that fall within the PDA. We often see this come up in um, what an employer might say is a legitimate concern about a female pregnant employee's safety and ability to perform the job. Um, it is sufficient for an employer to, to ask whether an individual um, can actually perform the job duties the same way you would for any other disabled individual. So employers can require a pregnant employee to be able to perform the essential duties of her job. If, she, if the job involves heavy lifting and she is prohibited from doing that, um, we're, and we'll see this in a little bit, but we need to treat this the same way we would treat any other individual that has some sort of disability to prevent them from doing the essential job functions. Um, what we cannot do is make decisions about things like that and any sort of assumption or stereotype about um, the, the pregnant employee. So you cannot look at a pregnant woman and decide that she's um, automatically prevented from lifting more than 15 pounds or operating a forklift. There has to be an interactive discussion about that the same way there would be with a, any other individual um, who has or is perceived to have a disability. We also can't make stereotypes or assumptions based on an individual's schedule or their attendance. Uh, it, it would not uh, be legally permissible to assume that someone applying for a job who is pregnant would not be able to be at work on a regular basis because we assume they'll have regular doctor's appointments. Um, the PDA specifically prevents us from making any sort of decisions based on those stereotypes. And I think one of the situations that employers t sometimes find themselves in is when they're trying to be helpful, you know, and, and being a concerned employer, and you don't want to jeopardize somebody's health, so you make this assumption or have a stereotype that a pregnant woman shouldn't be operating a forklift or shouldn't be working outdoors in, in various weather conditions or something of that nature. And it's so it's not even uh, discriminationally based animus, it's out of care and concern. But the PDA makes that very clear that, that you can't operate from those assumptions. If you have those concerns, that needs to be brought up in, a, in an interactive process. And, and unless there's a medical reason that the employee has told you they're not able to perform those type of job duties, we can't just make that assumption or say it's in your best interest for you not to do this, so we're not going to let you do it. That's right, and that's probably a nice segue into um, the way in which we see this play out with the EEOC's requirements to equal access to benefits. And the first uh, bullet point, the, the responsibility for all employers to provide light duty. If that employer provides light duty for employees, employees who are not pregnant, but who are similar in, in their ability or inability to work. As you may or may not have heard, this recently um, came up in a case involving UPS. Uh, the Supreme Court in 2015 issued its ruling on the UPS case. In that case, UPS refused to give a female pregnant employee a less demanding shift when her doctor ordered her not to lift heavy items while pregnant. Um, put another way, when a doctor ordered light duty work. UPS did have a policy that offered light duty work to employees who had an on-the-job injury or who had an ADA qualifying injury, but refused to do that for its pregnant employee. Uh, instead, the UPS made her take an extended unpaid leave for the pendency of her pregnancy, during which she lost her benefits and uh, did not allow her to return until after the baby was born. Um, the case worked its way through district court and the Fourth Circuit, and both the district court and the Fourth Circuit said it was a um, pregnancy blind policy that it had. The policy did not specifically say it would not offer light duty for pregnant people. It just only allowed for light duty work for those who suffered an on-the-job injury or had an ADA qualifying injury. So um, the, AD, the uh, 
district court and circuit court decided that since they weren't specifically discriminating against pregnant people, it was not a violation of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. In a surprise for many people who have um, observed over the years how various judge, uh, justices come out on employment-related issues, the Supreme Court did find that the claim was viable under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, that the policy, while maybe uh, facially neutral, had a disparate impact on pregnant women, and it remanded the case back down to the Fourth Circuit to determine if, in fact, the UPS um, policy did discriminate against this individual um, female. It's interesting to note that UPS, quote, voluntarily, unquote, changed their policy in October of this year, and they've been very quick to say it had absolutely nothing to do with the Supreme Court's ruling or the EEOC's recent um, guidelines from July of 2014, um, but uh, brilliant minds can disagree on that one. The equal access to benefits concept in the EEOC regs also impacts leave, and similar to what we saw in UPS, employers may not force an employee to take leave because she is or has been pregnant so long as she can perform the job. So it's not enough to say um, you have to go out uh, for the remainder of your pregnancy or you cannot return right after that you have to take 12 weeks, what have you. Um, if an employee is absent from work because of a pregnancy-related condition and then recovers, the employer cannot require the employee to remain on leave, leave until the baby's birth. Um, parental leave, if parental leave is provided to the employer or to the employees, the employer must provide it to um, men and women on the same terms. Uh, health insurance must be offered to cover pregnancy if we offer health insurance in general. Uh, important to note that even if the employer provides health insurance benefits, it is not required to pay for health insurance coverage of abortion unless the life of the mother is endangered. And finally, employers must allow women who are on pregnancy-related leave to accrue seniority in the same way uh, they are for any other reasons unrelated to pregnancy. So the overriding theme in all of these equal access to benefit examples is that if you as the employer offers something to uh, a disabled individual as defined by the ADA, you must offer those same things to uh, pregnant individuals. It's, it should be viewed in the same or similar analysis. Which uh, this following slide summarizes nicely. Pregnancy-related impairments may be covered under the ADA if you, meet the, if you otherwise meet the criteria for disability, including um, being regarded as disabled. So um, once that person has met that standard, employers must provide reasonable accommodations to workers with pregnancy-related impairments the same way it would for any other disabled individual. Our last um, policy that we're going to talk about of our top five policies to review in 2015 are policies related to sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. First, for federal employers or those with federal contracts, there was recently an executive order, 13672, that uniformly prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And then in December of 2014, the Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program issued its final rule implementing this executive order. But for the vast majority of us that do not have federal contracts or have um, federal employees, there are 21 states and the District of Columbia that prohibit private employers from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation Eight other states prohibit discrimination against public employees on the basis of sexual orientation. And most of these 21 states that prohibit discrimination um, for sexual orientation also prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity or expression. So those would encompass situations um, involving transgender individuals or um, uh, trans identity individuals. And Susan, I just would like to point out that OSHA, the Office of Safety and Health 
has just recently, as of June 1st, issued new guidance for transgender employees' use of restrooms in the workplace. And so we are going to be providing a client alert hopefully this week to update employers on these recommendations and guidelines that OSHA has, propound, has put forth. Great. Thank you, Joyce. And this slide, similar to our workplace drug policy slide, shows the states in which we have laws either um, uh, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, where we have states that are prohibiting discrimination um, on the basis of sexual orientation only, meaning their statute doesn't reference gender identity, um, and states that prohibit uh, discrimination against public employees on these same basis. So what would we recommend in a tips for takeaway situation for anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policies? I would suggest that you go back into those policies and make sure that you're including pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity in those policies. Even, one might say, if you're in a state that does not provide that same sort of prohibition or protection. Again, this is an area where we're seeing a lot of movement by the EEOC where we're seeing a lot of movement by various state legislatures. So it's quite possible that if you're not in one of those 21 states right now, your state might be adding to the list um, by the time we have another CLE a year from now. And therefore, you're not racing to catch up with the law. You're in front of or ahead of the law. Remember, we as employers are always allowed to do more than the law requires to protect our employees. So even if you're in a state that doesn't have these prohibitions, it makes sense to think about whether or not your culture is such that we want to make sure that it is clear that we are not going to allow for any discrimination or harassment on the basis of pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Remember that under EEOC, they have definitely, and courts have recognized that even under federal law, which does not protect sexual orientation and gender identity, Specifically, they have found that those claims can also fall under the general protection of the sex discrimination and, and harassment. That's right, because as I'm sure you all know, um, when we're talking about sexual harassment, we're not just talking about harassment that's sexual in nature, but any sort of harassment that's on the basis of one's gender. And certainly, um, gender identity and sexual orientation we've seen time and time again is encompassed within the Title VII's inclusion of sex and gender as a protected characteristic. Another issue that we wanted to bring up is that we are going to be sending out a client alert or you can contact us if you have additional questions, but the uh, DOL has also just issued updated FMLA forms that include some information about uh, the Genetic Information and Non-Discrimination Act and making sure that healthcare providers know that they're not supposed to be providing genetic information that would be run afoul of, the, of GINA in their certification on the FMLA forms. So if you are using the FMLA forms that are uh, promulgated by the DOL, they had, they had te technically expired in February of 2015, and they've just been extended for the past couple months on a month-to-month -month basis. And at the end of May, the DOL has actually updated those forms and has new forms, and those should be used if you are using the DOL FMLA forms. So that's just another update that, you know, as you know, in employment law, things are changing all the time, and so we really try to keep abreast of those changes and make sure that our clients know that the changes are happening and best practices for dealing with those changes. And another way that we can provide that information is that we have had several webinars already. Uh, there was a, one in April, uh, New Horizon, What You Need to Know About California Employment Law, and one on dealing with changes of tel telecommuting workers that was presented in May. Those are both available on the TCLE website, which is listed on this slide. We just did this presentation, which will be recorded and available within two weeks if anyone has additional um, access, wants additional access to this presentation. And we would like to thank you all for attending. Please feel free to contact either Joyce or myself if you have anything that you'd like to discuss outside of this um, format. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much.